Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and you can think of me as your friendly guide to the English language. Today, I have two segments, one about irregardless and one about words from crime fiction. But before we start, I have an AP-style webinar coming up February 28th with Reagan.com. It's a basic and intermediate level session for people who need to know AP style for work. I'll put a link you can use to register in the show notes, and there's also a link in my email newsletter, which you can sign up for at quickanddirtytips.com. Let's get started with a listener question. Hi, Grammar Girl. I'm an English teacher in Boston, Massachusetts, and I am freaking out. One of my students tells me that irregardless is now a word, and apparently it's been added to some dictionaries. Can you clear this up for me? This is serious panic time. In the immortal words of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, don't panic. Irregardless is a word, but it's not a proper word. And your student's assertion that it's in some dictionaries is a great opportunity to talk about the different kinds of entries in dictionaries. But first, let's talk about irregardless. Some people mistakenly use irregardless when they mean regardless, and that's considered to be an error. Regardless means regard less, without regard, or despite something. For example, Squiggly will eat chocolate regardless of the consequences, meaning Squiggly will eat chocolate without regard for the consequences, despite the consequences, and so on. The prefix ir is a negative prefix. So if you add the prefix ir to a word that's already negative, like regardless, You're making a double negative that means literally without without regard. The first example the Oxford English Dictionary shows for irregardless is actually from another dictionary, Harold Wentworth's American Dialect Dictionary from 1912, which places the origin of the word in western Indiana. I also briefly went down a rabbit hole looking at other words from the American Dialect Dictionary. They include doodad, doojigger, finagle, fuddy-duddy, and nummies to describe delicious food. We definitely know how to make up silly words. But I have good news, Hoosiers. A Google book search shows irregardless appearing earlier in other locations. I found it in documents from the state of Michigan from 1893, a publication from the state of California from 1887, and the wordhistories.net website has a screenshot of a poem called The Old Woman in the Tabby that uses irregardless in the City Gazette and Daily Advertiser newspaper published in Charleston, South Carolina in 1795. It looks like irregardless got around even in the early days and was also used quite eloquently. For example, here's the irregardless sentence from Dr. J.B. Tremblay's 1887 report about meteorology for the state of California. The winds would blow. The storms would come. The heat would vitalize. The cold would freeze. And the various seasons would pass, irregardless of what men could do or say as warnings of the weather on the morrow. That's nice. Language experts speculate that irregardless comes from a combination of the words regardless and irrespective, and that another reason people might say irregardless is that they're following the pattern of words such as irregular and irreplaceable. But regardless already has the less suffix on the end, so it's not like regular and replaceable. It's already negative. And because irregardless is a double negative, some people also speculate that it could have arisen because people sometimes use double negatives for emphasis. Now on to dictionaries. Although it's true that the American Heritage Dictionary, the Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary, dictionary Dictionary.com, and the OED all list the word irregardless, they also all call it non-standard. Listing a word as non-standard is a way that dictionaries concede that a word is in common use, but isn't really a proper word. Standard language is defined as the language spoken by educated native speakers. But comprehensive dictionaries also include non-standard words, dialect, colloquialisms, and jargon. Words like ain't, conversate, and irregardless. 
It seems pretty common for people to look up a word in a dictionary, and if it's there, they think it's fine to use that word in every circumstance. It's the, look, it's a word phenomenon. But you have to look a little further to see what kind of word it is. And if it's non-standard in some way, you should use it with caution. You'll sound uneducated if you go around saying things like, I ain't going to conversate with him irregardless of the consequences. Sometimes words make the transition from non-standard to standard English. My dictionaries assure me that snuck is a word that falls into this category, although I know some of you won't like that. But since irregardless has been disparaged its whole life, and many educated people still rail against it, and the word isn't commonly seen in edited writing, I don't believe irregardless is going to make the transition to standard language anytime soon. And one final thought about dictionaries. Irregardless was listed in every dictionary I checked, but sometimes words will show up in one dictionary and not another, and it's important to realize that there are different kinds of dictionaries. For example, there are prescriptive and descriptive dictionaries. A prescriptive dictionary focuses on the way language should be according to traditional rules. And a descriptive dictionary focuses on the language that's actually in use by the population. So a descriptive dictionary is likely to include words that a prescriptive dictionary would leave out. Many older dictionaries are prescriptive, but most modern dictionaries are descriptive. Okay, and one last thought. The common rant you'll hear people saying about irregardless is that irregardless is not a word. Which brings us to the question, what is a word? That can get tricky, and I've gotten into debates about whether a word that was used a hundred years ago and isn't in most dictionaries and nobody today would know what it means is still a word, and we just agreed to disagree. If you're curious, I was on the side arguing that it's still a word. But I think it's more straightforward with irregardless. It's in all major dictionaries, with a definition. And when people use it, you know what they mean, even if you pretend they don't because it's a double negative. Irregardless is a word. It just isn't a word you should use in seriousness if you want educated people to respect you or take you seriously. Thanks again for the question. If you'd like to hear your question on the podcast, now you can leave it as a voicemail at 83-321-4-GIRL. That's 83-321-44475. Before literature, there was mythology. If you love great stories, there's a new podcast you'll really enjoy, Mythology from the Parcast Network. It's full of action-packed tales of heroes, gods, monsters, and events that shaped the earth. Every episode uses a cast of voice actors to dramatize an exciting story pulled from an ancient culture. You'll learn how our ancestors saw the universe and how those stories continue to resonate today. Mythology covers Greek, Norse, and Egyptian myths, as well as lesser-known stories from around the world. Hear episodes about Athena, Loki, the Epic of Gilgamesh, and Osiris and Isis. I listened to the episode about Hercules last night and loved it. You should definitely give mythology a try. Search and subscribe to Mythology wherever you listen to podcasts. That's M-Y-T-H-O-L-O-G-Y. Or visit Parcast, P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com slash mythology to listen now. Support for today's show also comes from Third Love, with tagless labels, ultra soft fabric, signature half cup sizing, and straps that won't slip. Third Love is the most comfortable bra you'll own, and you can take their Fit Finder quiz to find your perfect fit in less than a minute. But if anything's not perfect, returns and exchanges are free and easy. And now, Third Love offers a brand new collection of super breathable cotton t shirt bras and cotton underwear. You won't want to miss it. I took the Fit Finder quiz, and with just a few questions about how my current bras fit, they were able to find my proper size. It's definitely easier than dragging a bunch of bras into a fitting room and hoping for the best. Third Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone. So, right now, they're offering you, my listeners, 15% off your first order. 
Go to thirdlove.com slash grammar now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 15% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash grammar for 15% off today. And now on to crime words. Did you grow up with a love of detective work and a mystery novel always in tow? In the midst of all that crime consumption, you probably picked up a handful of terms like whodunit and cliffhanger, words that are usually associated with crime fiction. If you've ever wondered where those words come from, this segment is for you. Whodunit is another term for murder mystery. Accounts of who coined whodunit are conflicting. If you check the Google Books Ngram viewer, you could be forgiven for thinking the first documented use was in 1925 in the literary magazine The Virginia Quarterly Review. But that path is a red herring, a term we'll get to in a minute, because sleuthing revealed that the entry is mistaken, a conglomeration of two separate publications. In fact, Merriam-Webster, the Oxford English Dictionary, and The Guardian all credit Daniel Gordon— a book reviewer for the American News of Books, with creating the term in 1930. When faced with the task of writing a review about a standard murder mystery, half-masked murder, Gordon deemed the story, quote, a satisfactory whodunit, unquote. And what about sleuthing? It was a noun first. Sleuth arose in the Middle Ages from sloth, the Old Norse word for trail, and described a track or trail of a person. The 1872 definition of sleuth, meaning detective, was derived from sleuth hound, a breed of dog similar to a bloodhound that was once common in Scotland and was used for finding the track or trail of a person. The sleuth hound was renowned for its remarkable sense of smell, reportedly having the ability to track thieves solely by the sense of the items they had stolen. Sleuth Hound was also a nickname for a keen investigator. Surprisingly, that same Old Norse word sloth also gave us the word slot. The origin is a bit uncertain, but according to the Online Etymology Dictionary, one of the original meanings was, quote, a narrow opening into which something else can be fitted, unquote. And if you squint, you can maybe see how that could be related peripherally to the idea of a track or trail. If you've ever worked at a newspaper in the United States, you'll know that the slot is also the position in the middle of a horseshoe-shaped desk where the chief sub-editor sits. And Bill Walsh, who was a Washington Post copy editor who wrote books such as The Elephants of Style and Lapsing into a Comma, ran a popular language website called The Slot. Maybe you can think of copy editors as sleuthing for errors and solving language mysteries. But back to crime. It's time for the red herring. Today, the phrase red herring is often used to describe a fact— idea, or subject that takes people's attention away from the central point being considered. But it first held a quite literal meaning. Herrings are a type of fish that formerly played a significant role in supporting fisheries in North Atlantic seas. When salt cured and smoked, herrings develop a strong scent and turn red or dark brown. Because of this potent stench, 17th century fugitives used red herrings to avert scent hounds from their trails. It's also thought that the smelly fish were dragged along paths to train young dogs to follow scents. The present-day metaphoric meaning of red herring first appeared in a verbose 1782 British parliamentary speech about taxes. And if you're a reader of mystery or crime fiction— you know that you always need to be wary of red herrings, clues meant to throw you or the investigator off the track of the real culprit. And now on to some other crime and mystery terms. You may wonder why an investigator is sometimes called a gumshoe. In the early 20th century, men wore heeled lace-up shoes and boots, footwear that didn't allow its wearer to walk quietly a fact that posed a multitude of problems for those whose jobs required covert missions, like detectives. 
the first use of the term gumshoe as an informal synonym for plainclothes detective was in 1906, simply stemming from the words gum and shoe. Gumshoes, or gums, were essentially the rubber-soled predecessors to current-day sneakers, also known as tennis shoes, gym shoes, and other various regional terms. Whatever you call them, these shoes were often worn by detectives and suggested stealth because the soft soles let them sneak around quietly. And finally, don't you both love it and hate it when a story ends with a cliffhanger? Meaning a suspenseful situation, a cliffhanger is a plot device used in a series to keep viewers engaged and eager to know what happens next. Cliffhanger is a term you've likely heard if you watch primetime TV shows. It's also another term with paradoxical tales of its creation. The word originated in the 1930s from continued next week radio and silent cinema serials in which the main characters frequently found themselves in imminent danger at the end of each episode, sometimes literally hanging off the edge of a cliff. Other sources claim that English author Thomas Hardy's A Pair of Blue Eyes was the true beginning of the word cliffhanger. The 1873 novel, first published in segments in Tinsley's magazine from 1872 through 1873, also featured a literal cliffhanger at the end of one chapter. The main character, Henry Knight, finds himself hanging off the edge of a cliff by his fingertips after he's just saved a girl from plunging into oblivion herself. But while this 1800s story may have included literal cliffhanging, the Oxford English Dictionary lists the first actual printed instance of the word coming in 1930 in the magazine Variety. That segment was written by Ariel John, an intern at Quick and Dirty Tips. Ariel is a senior at CUNY Queens College and a media studies major. And if you're itching for crime stories that don't end in cliffhangers, check out Case Closed, a new true crime podcast about the times the bad guy didn't get away with it. Each season, Case Closed tracks one murder from crime to trial to conviction, and the show's produced by my publisher, Macmillan. This season digs into the disappearance of 19-year-old Aaron Corwin in Joshua Tree State Park. The first episode is available now, so go listen and subscribe. Finally, we're celebrating a big milestone at Quick and Dirty Tips. I actually founded the network more than 12 years ago, and since that time, many, many people have contributed to make it bigger and better. And this month, we've passed the 300 million download mark. 300 million. Honestly, it's hard for me to wrap my head around that number, but you are one of those listeners. So thanks to you and the entire Quick and Dirty Tips team for making the network as enduring and wonderful as it is. That's all. Thanks for listening. Bye.